Thank you for joining the HDIAC podcast, discussing interoperability among agencies and local population during multilateral peacekeeping operations. This is part two of two. Interoperability. Are there different kinds of interoperabilities? Um, you mentioned that you might want to talk about a, a concept of horizontal and vertical interoperability. Absolutely. So I am um, working together. Uh, the example I just gave about what the meaning of security is uh, talks about uh, agencies working roughly at the same level. Uh, I call that horizontal inter interoperability. And, and that would be kind of any kind of interagency work that one might do would require working across different organizational cultures uh, so that you wanna, we don't wanna, I'll say harmonize uh, understandings and uh, across those cultures. That's horizontal interoperability. But in peacekeeping, uh, in disaster management, in, in all sorts of uh, ways, all of those agencies work with local populations. They also have to worry about what I call uh, vertical interoperability, which is the mission working effectively with local, local populations. So the distinction that I draw between um, between horizontal and vertical is that you you are working across agencies and working from uh, local populations to agencies or agencies to local populations. So uh, this is the distinction that I make. But I think that achieving interoperability or, or achieving the most interoperability that you can achieve depends upon the same kinds of social relations and social understandings, cultural understandings, when right. you go across and when you go down. It's just that the nature of culture, the nature of the cultural unit is a little bit different. Yeah. So um, I thought I thought the analogy to disaster response, crisis response, that sort of thing was a, a, actually a, a very good one. And, you know, practical experience, again, I, I never occurred to me until you just said that, but it, it is very similar. And uh, do you have any thoughts on strategic communication? I, I think that there that's got to be an important component, particularly when you're talking about the vertical integration for people who didn't even know they existed until they came together. Sure. So, so let me uh, let me sort of flesh out some of this vertical uh, and horizontal a little bit with an example. It's not as a disaster example, but it's, a, it's an example from South Lebanon. The UN has a long-standing mission in South Lebanon called uh, UNIFIL, uh, and it's very much concerned with the security of of South Lebanon, and it has its own view of what security is. And so, it will promote security. It will talk about security. It will it will uh, communicate about, we want to make things more secure. So at a horizontal level, all of the agencies that might be working there will agree what that means. But the local understanding of security is very, can be very different. So when you interview, uh, for example, mothers uh, in South Lebanon, when you say security, what it means to them is the ability to feed their family, to have safe housing. So if you communicate about security, you wind up with a symbol because it's language and language is symbolic, which has multiple meanings to, uh, in, to, different, to different groups. So in strategic communication, one would have to be sure to align your understanding of the words that, and, and symbols that you're using with the local understanding. So how does culture inter influence interoperability of uh, both individual and group behaviors? That's a great question, but in order to answer it, let me go back and say Please. something about what culture is as I understand it. Because yeah. there are many ways to understand culture. It is sort of a, um, a curiosity that in the 1950s, uh, a very famous pair of uh, anthropologists and sociologists did a study of all the definitions of culture, and they came up with 155 different definitions. So... Uh, and this is important um, because there are different ways to understand culture lead to different ways of acting. But the, the, um, the definition of culture that I like, that I like to use, is a uh, definition about how culture provides meaning uh, for, for people. And, it's, and I, I use the words of uh, the late Roy Dandrati, uh, who uh, wrote the following. 
and that culture it consists of learned systems of uh, meaning that are communicated through natural language and other symbols. And those systems of meaning orient us. They have uh, what we could call uh, functions. And those functions are threefold. They tell us what's real in the world by creating cultural entities. They tell us how to act towards those cultural entities. That means the physical world and others. And I'll illustrate this in a minute. And they tell us how to feel about the world and our interactions with it. So these three things, uh, representative, directive, affective functions, are what creates our particular cultural sense of reality. Now, if you serve uh, in a mission in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, you may try to promote an intervention, let's say a sanitation intervention. We want to avoid cholera in this particular thing. So we're going to get people to build pit toilets, build latrines, and we'll tell them about the, the benefits of uh, separating fecal matter from your drinking water supply and so on. Right. And you might build them a latrine and you might come back and you might find that those latrines are not used or they're used for storage. And, uh, and when you investigate that, you discover that the local community says, oh, no, we can't, we can't use those because of the jinn. Well, the jinn being spirits, being uh, bad, uh, bad uh, uh, folks who, uh, who might come out and, and do us harm. A jinn, to my middle class, uh, New York City, uh, 1960s uh, upbringing, I would say, Jin, what are you talking about? That's not real. But the representational aspect of culture for this group makes those entities real. So then how do you, how do you act towards them? Well, you don't go into the latrine because, and you certainly don't go there at night because they'll, they'll get you and make you sick or, or harm you in some way. And then how do you feel about that? Well, there's lots of ways. If you're, if you're a mission and you're digging latrines for, for folks and they're looking at those saying, this is just gonna harm me, the way they're gonna feel about the mission, the way they're gonna feel about your actions towards them are not, oh, they're trying to help me, uh, or they might be uh, trying to help me, but they also might be mixed with feelings of, what's wrong with these people? Why don't they understand? So you can, a mission can founder on trying to do good without understanding what the local folks see as good. And, and you, what I also hear you saying is it could actually be counterproductive. It, it can indeed, it can indeed. And actually one of the really challenging things about interoperability for, um, so let me, before, before I do that, let me go back and, and talk a little bit more about culture. Please. So, I said there, there, there was, there's many, many definitions of culture, and I was just using a cognitive one about uh, meaning creation. But there's others that look at the material world that we use. We're, we're different because we have different material artifacts. Now, you mentioned that you served in, in, in Mogadishu. So uh, let me ask, uh, you were in the Marine Corps, and did you get the, uh, before you went, did you get the, uh, I think it was called the Quick Culture Card? Oh, indeed, yeah, carried it with me. Had it with me all the time. Okay. So if one looks at the quick culture card, the quick culture card has a lot of very useful information about it, like how to count from one to 10, not to shake hands with a woman, uh, not to use your left hand, how to recognize different forms of dress. All of these things are, are interesting and good bits of information. They are what I call traveler's advice. They basically tell you how not to make a faux pas. You, you, you don't, you know, go crashing in and, 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 and so you get the, this, but that's a very surface level. And part of the challenge for interoperability is that if you just look at the surface level, everything underneath it, the deeper levels become lost to you. You don't know why people are doing things. You just know what they're doing. And also having that uh, 
card saying, uh, Somalis don't do this, right? Uh, makes one, can make one think, oh, all Somalis don't do this. But one of the things we know about culture is that it's not universally shared. Right. We can interact, but we don't do it the same way. If you think about culture as driving cars around the street, we don't have accidents because we all manage enough shared information about how, what to do at an intersection, uh, but we don't always do the same thing. I mean, I know that that uh, you probably always stop at those stop signs at two o'clock in the morning when there's no other cars around, but I can testify that I have rolled right through those at, at uh, <laughs> two o'clock in the morning. And, um, and that's because I have a slightly different understanding than of, of those symbols then I'm guessing uh, you, you might might have maybe right. not. I don't I don't want to uh, really judge your driving, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to judge yours either. <laughs> so so the um, so the so the, the the thing is that that there's cultural heterogeneity heterogeneity of the way people interact, and so if you just have a card that says Somalis don't do this, Iraqis don't do this, you you can get in into trouble. Um, we also know that culture just orients and that people take their own experience and put it into it and filter that experience and it changes culture. So there, there's a, it's a very complex uh, kind of uh, kind of system. Now, when when we started having uh, multifunctional, um, complex integrated missions, those missions that required what you call a whole of, whole of government response, what the UN would see as requiring both military and the use of its uh, specialized agencies in complex situations. And we first started to get militaries and agencies and NGOs sort of not working well together. A great deal of effort happened to try and harmonize that, to try and understand why is it that we don't work well together? Ah, and so both uh, militaries and NGOs spent a lot of time looking at the characteristics of uh, of the other organizations and say, ah, okay, when you go to work with, when you're a military person, you're used to a, uh, a unitary command. When you go to work with an NGO, you should know that their st structure of authority is different. And so if, if you really want to work effectively with them, you need to learn to respect, you need to learn to understand where they're coming from. Uh, there was a very famous uh, war, Army War College paper, uh, I believe it was a master's paper in its origins, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the name of the author, um, that was titled um, Defenses from Mars, Status from Venus, and it was a way of talking about the agencies having different cultures. Well, there's a whole set of, of differences between military organizations and NGOs that were tried to harmonize by looking at these cultural dimensions. So that was an advance on, that is an advance on travel's advice, but it also can lead to stereotyping. Oh, all those right. NGO people, they wear Birkenstocks and it's very hard to overcome. So to uh, get beyond it, one has to look even lower than that to look at the cultural models that, that, um, that lead to the, gen the generative nature of, of cultural behavior that lead people to create new things. So if you think of this again by analogy to language, we all have a stock of words. We all see what comes out in our sentences, but we always recombine them, create them, and we use rules at the deep level to generate what actually comes out uh, and what other people hear. So the view of culture that sees culture as cognitive and meaning producing urges that we look lower at lower levels to see what um, to see what uh, uh, causes the whys that 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 lead us to get to where we are we can look at that in terms of negotiation theory too if we if we if we're negotiating we often come to a place and say this is what I want uh, I want this to happen we want so much water out of the Nile Egypt saying to Ethiopia, we want so much water out of the Nile. Okay. Ethiopia saying, nah, we're giving you nothing. We're going to, 
Okay, these are positions. Uh, the issue is water. But if they're going to cooperate, if they're going to be able to work, work seamlessly together, they have to agree about the why, about the under, underlying why. What's Why do you want that much water? Another way to achieve what you're what you're trying to uh, get, and in a similar way, when you go to to the deeper parts of culture, you're looking at the why. Why do people act the way they act? Under what circumstances do they do it? What is the meaning that it gives? Why would they? Do this? So you're looking uh, below, sort of what's obvious. So, um, do you have? Do you have an example of a peacekeeping mission that you think went particularly well? And if, if so, um, do you have any characteristics about that that you would pull out? I mean, we've already discussed that the, the traveler's tips card. Um, do, you, do you have an example of one that went well, one you'd recommend for study, and any quick characteristics that that one showed that you think makes it distinctive? So I don't, I don't have a whole mission because just like societies and cultures, right. missions and are heterogeneous, but there are examples within uh, peacekeeping operations, within stability operations, within these things of um, units that have managed to be re, be successful. And they um, and there was a a very very famous incident in um, in Iraq in Najaf, the holy city of Najaf, which is the second holiest city, I believe, of uh, for Shia. Uh, Islam, uh, where uh, a British officer, a senior crowd, decided to basically have all of the troops take a knee. They put their weapons down and they knelt down in order to um, to uh, defuse to uh, the what seemed to be an escalating situation. So that would be an example. He did it because he understood what that. Communicate. So the communication was um, was um, uh, was one in which he thought about what am I trying to communicate, and how are they going to receive it. Uh, another example, uh, which is I'm not sure I would want to emulate this, but a, a colleague of mine related to me how he had worked for the transitional uh, authority in um, in Iraq, and he'd been out. And about he's an Arabic speaker, and when he got back to the compound, uh, he found a big, a big mob, uh, sort of you know protest, not a mob, but a protest group outside, and they were protesting the the provisional uh, authority, uh, and so um, he was alone. He didn't have security with him, and he went up to them, and spoke with them, and they said, you know, we want the provisional authority out, and you know, why would somebody come speak? And he said, you know, I'm, I'm part of them. And they looked around and said, where's your security? And he said, God is my security. And at that moment, at that time, that was a very successful interaction. At another moment, it might not be. And part of what, um, what makes NGOs often different from militaries is the term of service that people have, where specialized agencies and NGO personnel tend to stay longer. So they build relationships vertically, they build relationships horizontally. And when a new person comes in with new ideas and new background, those relationships uh, can be fractured and that can lead to the, to the, to the failure of, of this. So there were two quick successes Failures are always easier to see, right? Because uh, yeah, of course, yeah, I, I think that, that that vertical really resonated at least with me. And you talked about staying on here inside the United States. I did disaster response for some time as, as the seal of Seaburf, and we were often told going into communities, "Hey, you're here temporarily," and the National Guard and the police and the fire would say, "We live here." We're going to be here for the long haul. And I think it was very important for us to respect that and give them the lead in those cases because we were going to be there, do a mission and leave. But those guys were there. They lived there. They went to church. They went to school with, with the folks in the community. So I, I, that really resonated with me. Thank you for joining the HDIAC podcast. To learn more about our other services, 
please reach out directly or visit us online at www.hdiac.org.